areas. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, be able to moderate this panel today. My name is Benjamin Tanis, I work for the Institute of International Relations uh, here at Prague. Um, and I'm joined by uh, several colleagues who you will see here. I will introduce in a second after I've introduced the overall theme of today's panel. Um, Today's panel will present the uh, ongoing results of a year-long project um, which has been supported by the Czech-Polish Forum and carried out uh, by the Czech-Polish Analytical Platform. As some of you know, this project started as a project of the Center for International Security of the Institute of International Relations and will be ongoing uh, as part of the new Center for European Security that's being established at the Institute for International Relations and of which I will be the co coordinator. So I hope that uh, we'll be actually working more closely together on several of these issues in the future, as well as establishing new areas of cooperation. Um, this project has looked at the current state of play, the opportunities and the limits to cooperation um, in a variety of arenas uh, within the defense, security, and military areas. So looking at attitudes and interests in the political sphere, looking at cooperation at the administrative level, um, in the state, uh, Ministry of State, in the Ministry of Defence, and the Trade and Industry Ministries. Uh, looking also at attitudes in the military, and we'll also go on in the future to look at attitudes in the defence industry. It's examined the um, compatibility and incompatibility of capabilities, um, generally and also with regard to interoperability. And it's finally also looked at legislative processes. In short, this has been an effort to understand where we are, in order to know how we want to get where we want, to, where it is that we want to go. The project will then go on and be able to identify how to actually take the opportunities and overcome the challenges that have been identified. And this clearly has impacts not just for Czech-Polish cooperation, but for the Visegrad 4 and beyond, which links us neatly into the themes of this symposium more generally. So, as I say, it's my pleasure today to be able to introduce, and this is actually the order in which they will speak, um, Jakub, Jakub Kroszkowski um, is a senior fellow in the Central European Department at the Centre for Eastern Studies in Warsaw. Vit Dostal, who is the director of the Research Centre, uh, the Association for International Affairs, I'm up, as we tend to know it, here in Prague. Uh, Tomasz Szatkowski, who is the president of the National Centre for Strategic Studies in Warsaw. Mikhail Szymeczka, my colleague from the uh, Institute of International Relations and who will also be working in the Centre for European Security and Martin, Tel Martin Telikowski, who is the Head of European Security and Defence Economics Project uh, at the Polish Institute of International Affairs in Warsaw. Unfortunately, Andrzej Wilk uh, was unable to join us today, but um, Jakub will actually be presenting his part of the research as well. So, without further ado, I will hand over to our speakers, uh, but just to give you a heads up as to the format for today, each of the speakers is going to speak, then we allow them a short chance to recapitulate, to perhaps comment on each other's talks, um, or to have them found actually slip in something they've forgotten, and then uh, we will hand over after that two questions from the audience, which we will deal with in groups of three. So you know there will be a couple of rounds of questions uh, at least, and so I hope you're all sharpening your minds, sharpening your pencils in anticipation for that. All right. So first of all, um, please get up. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, I would like to present you the results of uh, this part of the project that. Uh, uh, takes the, the topic co compatibilities and incompatibilities of attitudes and interests in the political sphere. Uh, I will present the, the Polish part, uh, with Dostal we present the Czech and uh, further on we will we'll share some uh, thesis and possibly recommendations. Uh, when it comes to uh, Polish uh, approach towards security and defense policy, uh, Poland bases its security and defense policy on three pillars, which is multilateral, bilateral, and national. When it comes to multilateral, it is derived from, its mem uh, from Poland's membership in NATO and the EU, and it's linked mainly with the uh, NATO's collective defense mechanism. Uh, when it comes to bilateral, uh, Poland relies on strong transatlantic bonds uh, with the US and American role in, in Europe. And uh, the third pillar, which is national, uh, concerns Poland's effort in modernizing its own army and improving its capabilities. Uh, these three pillars are complemented with uh, regional cooperation, uh, which concerns mainly Visegrad Group and Weimar Triangle. And of course, uh, when it's possible, Poland also hopes to uh, develop 
uh, its good neighborhood relations with partners uh, in the East, which are not part of, of the NATO. Uh, Poland's security and defense policy is defined uh, by two major documents currently. The first one is uh, national security strategy, uh, which new version uh, has been adopted uh, by, the par uh, by the government and signed by the president a few weeks ago. And the second important document is strategy of development of the national security system of the Republic of Poland, uh, looking up to uh, the year 2022. Uh, which has been adopted uh, last year. Uh, and uh, when we look at these uh, documents, and uh, if we will uh, add to, to this view the previous version of the national security strategy, it is clear that these three pillars of Poland's security and defense policy uh, remain unchanged. And it is, it is uh, uh, important to say that the previous version of the national security strategy has been uh, adopted by a different government and a different president, but still uh, the new version is uh, very similar and also bases its uh, main themes on, on these three pillars that I mentioned. Uh, so we can clearly say that uh, the, the core of the Poland security and defense policy remains unchanged throughout the years and uh, all major political parties agree on, on uh, the most important uh, parts of, of this way of thinking about security and, and uh, defense. Uh, when we look at the, at the threat perception, how it uh, changes throughout the years, uh, uh, there, is, uh, there are some important uh, differences. And for example, in the 2007 National Security Strategy, uh, the document stated that Poland is a safe country, the development of international situation is positive. Uh, authors uh, claim that in foreseeable future, eruption of a large-scale armed conflict is unlikely. However, of course, uh, the importance of art Article 5 and um, mm, possible change in the security environment uh, was taken into, into consideration. Uh, this rhetoric slightly changed in 2013, uh, and then the even though security, international security environment was described as favorable, uh, the document states that uh, one should not entirely exclude the possibility um, uh, of uh, armed conflict within, within the, uh, the region. And uh, the, the recent uh, document uh, adopted uh, a few weeks ago uh, states uh, very, very clearly uh, that uh, the conflict in Ukraine uh, changed uh, the situation uh, in the region uh, extremely. And uh, in the document, there is also a um, bad case scenario uh, which says that Poland may be engaged in a, in a conflict in the region or military pressure can be uh, posed on, on Poland. Uh, and, and that is a scenario that we should uh, strongly take uh, into consideration. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to the role of the NATO, it has not changed extremely within the, the recent years. And uh, from the, um, or, uh, both in the 2007 document and uh, in 2014 national security strategy, uh, there is a strong impact on increasing NATO capabilities uh, to carry out uh, collective defense. There is also a very uh, high importance given to the role of uh, the US uh, forces in the uh, Europe. And of course, uh, the, the recent document uh, mentions the, the eastern flank of NATO and argues that uh, this should be uh, strengthened uh, significantly. And also uh, in these documents, uh, there are some clear uh, doubts about the, the changes that are ongoing in NATO and uh, Polish authorities are uh, aware that uh, the will to invest in armies in, in NATO countries, especially in Europe, uh, is, is not going in the direction that Poland would like it to, to go. Uh, so uh, there is this strong uh, impact put on the collective defense uh, within the NATO. However, uh, on the other hand, uh, 
Poland is also uh, very uh, focused on its national capabilities and uh, these strategic documents uh, clearly write that uh, uh, Poland uh, should both uh, focus on, on, on the NATO and uh, its role within the NATO, but also uh, uh, should be focused on, on uh, how it can uh, rely on its own uh, armed forces uh, if uh, any possible conflict uh, would occur. Uh, these, uh, these strategies uh, were also, uh, or this way of thinking uh, when it comes to security and defense policy uh, was also very clear during the recent uh, NATO summit in Newport. And uh, Poland uh, tried, uh, the, the priorities that, that Poland uh, uh, tried to, to focus on were uh, the uh, collective defense and uh, strengthening uh, NATO presence in the eastern flank and also the, uh, changing NATO attitude towards, towards Russia. Uh, it, uh, uh, of course, Poland, as, as every NATO member, uh, uh, was uh, happy with the results. Uh, that's, the, that's the official rhetoric. Uh, however, of, uh, the, uh, the, the major success that, that uh, Polish authorities mention is uh, uh, the sentence about continuous air land and maritime presence and meaningful military activity in the eastern part of the alliance both on uh, or in, in, uh, based on rotational uh, basis so uh, even though uh, polish authorities were not able uh, to push forward the idea of continuous presence this uh, rotational uh, presence uh, made polish polish authorities uh, happy uh, also, the rhetorics about Russia uh, in the, the final document of the summit uh, was very, very uh, favorable towards Pol uh, Polish point of view. However, uh, the founding act uh, of the uh, Russia-NATO cooperation uh, was not terminated, uh, which was one of the Polish priorities. And I think I will, I will, I will stop here and uh, pass the floor to, to Vitek. Thank you very much, Jakub. Thank you, thank you, Ben. Uh, well, I will follow up to uh, what uh, uh, what Kuba said about uh, uh, about the, the uh, about the Polish uh, position. Uh, actually, in uh, in uh, in the, the Czech Republic, we are in a quite uh, different situation because. Uh, uh, in, in Poland, the new security strategy has been adopted uh, recently, whereas in the, in the Czech case, uh, we still have valid security strategy and the foreign policy concept from 2011, yet uh, these documents uh, should not be regarded as a driving force for the Czech foreign and security policy, since uh, there has been a shift in the government last year or this year, uh, after the elections which took place last year, and uh, those documents also do not reflect uh, uh, the Ukrainian crisis. However, if you look into the security strategy and the foreign policy concept, then you can see that uh, there is a, uh, mentioned as a possible threat to, for, the, for the Czech Republic, uh, the states which are trying to enlarge its sphere of influence uh, around the world and which are trying to, to use uh, various means of uh, of uh, foreign and uh, and uh, and uh, defense uh, capabilities for to to do so. So, uh, and my my perception of of the, of the current situation is that uh, if those documents were taken seriously, then the Czech uh, uh, attitude and uh, conduct uh, uh, during the, the, the crisis and uh, in Ukraine and the Russian-Ukrainian conflict would be are quite uh, uh, quite different uh, on the other hand uh, the discussions in in the in, in the ministry of foreign affairs and, and in the ministry of defense are going on and there should be uh, uh, probably the new foreign uh, and security uh, uh, policy strategy uh, next year so we have to wait until uh, we have some comprehensive documents. So far, uh, we can only 
uh, look on uh, the, the Czech uh, uh, um, policy in that regard from uh, the governmental program which is quite uh, brief in the passages uh, uh, focused on the on the security and foreign policy of course and uh, from from the speeches of uh, of the uh, of the prime minister and foreign minister there have been quite uh, many of them uh, in the last year and we can see a gradual shift of uh, of the czech policy in that regard so I will start with that, and then perhaps if I have some time, I will also look on the, for, on the public opinion pools, which are quite interesting in that regard, and which may, uh, I believe, uh, form uh, the Czech uh, stance uh, in, uh, in, the political, in the political sphere. So uh, if we uh, look on the threat, uh, threat perception uh, in the Czech Republic, then it is quite variable. If we leave aside the position of president, uh, which would be a separate uh, panel or separate uh, conference, I believe, symposium, uh, which we, we would have to devote for that, uh, I, we can see or witness following uh, approaches. Uh, first of all, uh, the Czech Republic, uh, you have to say, uh, accepts all uh, the sanctions vis-a-vis -vis Russia, though some top politicians, uh, uh, including the prime minister, often voice uh, uh, the fact that, or, or their opinion, that the sanctions have not changed the Russian behavior. Uh, what is uh, something uh, we have to also take into account, that there is not that much uh, trust uh, voiced towards this mechanism. Uh, Secondly, the Prime Minister often and repeatedly stressed uh, that uh, uh, there must be a, a continuation of the dialogue with, uh, uh, with Russia and uh, that uh, the, the enlargement of NATO or EU even should not take place for the sake of escalation of any tensions between the West and, and Russia. That are uh, the words of the Prime Minister which he mentioned, uh, uh, I think, in, uh, in the Chamber of Deputies in, in, uh, in September. Uh, uh, thirdly, uh, the position of the, of, the, of the Prime Minister, as he, as he put it, is that uh, according to him, uh, the Czech Republic is not directly endangered by, by, the, by the Russian-Ukrainian conflict. Uh, that's what he mentioned, I think, in June in, uh, in one uh, opt-ed uh, in, in, the, in the Czech Daily. Uh, perhaps the situation has changed, but uh, that's the, the last uh, comment I, I found. Uh, and uh, of course, we have the, 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 the famous uh, uh, declaration from the beginning of June that uh, the, the Czech Republic is not calling for the strengthening of uh, NATO or US forces in the Central and Eastern, Eastern Europe, uh, since these steps may anger Russia and um, may make the solution of the conflict less, uh, less, less probable. So, there are the, the, the attitudes which we have to take into uh, think, take into account. On the other hand, the government is committed to stabilize the situation of the defense sector, and it declared uh, that it will the, the defense spending should rise uh, to 1.4 percent of GDP by 2020. What is a kind of a commitment to 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 enhance also the uh, common. Uh, defense capabilities. So uh, uh, it's quite hard to, to draw a comprehensive picture of the, of the Czech Republic attitude uh, towards the changing security environment, and uh, we have to wait at least some time uh, for, for, for new uh, policy documents. Uh, but we can see the stress. Uh, uh, in that approach, which uh, on on dialogue, uh, on non-confrontation, uh, on uh, uh, um, and, and uh, the Czech attitude also underlines some economic risks for for the Czech Republic and uh, uh, the Prime Minister quite I think unfortunately stressed that the situation of the Czech Republic is, Republic is is uh, different to the position of Poland or, or Baltic states. That has been that has been mentioned in one of his uh, his uh, articles, and uh, of course, then we can see that uh, 
the Czech perception is literally different to 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 the Polish one. Uh, on the other hand, if you look on the on what the, the public opinion thinks uh, about uh, especially the the ongoing uh, conflict uh, in uh, in in uh, Eastern Europe, then we can see the, the rise of those who think that the situation uh, endangers uh, uh, the Czech Republic and. Uh, and uh, that might be kind of a signal because these last data are from from September, and there has been the rise uh, of 16% uh, uh, of those who think that the conflict poses a security threat for the for the Czech Republic. I have some more data on on, on the public opinion, but I'll stop there to be nice to uh, our uh, chair panel. Thank you very much indeed for well behaved panelists we have today. Um, perhaps you could just clarify, was it 16 or 60%? 16. 16, 16 one six. Okay. So it's from 49 uh, in June to 65 in September. Okay, 49 to 65. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Right, now we'll move on um, through our order of speakers um, to Tomasz Szatkowski, who is the president of the National Center for Statistics. Strategic studies in Warsaw. Tomasz. Thank you, Ben. Uh, so, my share of work uh, in the project relates mostly to the uh, administrative and organizational for, uh, framework that is relevant to defense cooperation. And, and um, I'm going to uh, look at how this either enables or precludes an effective. Uh, cooperation and uh, what level of co com um, com com compatibility is there between both uh, systems. Um, well, I, I will not go on to describe uh, both um, structures in terms of uh, national security uh, apparatus and, and processes in, in, in both countries because that would be a very laborious and and boring uh, thing to do. Uh, I think that some of the some of the aspects are quite obvious. I mean, the, the role, for instance, the role of principal actors. Like, for instance, uh, in in Poland, we, we have a greater role which is attached to the president. I mean, he, he has some role in 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 national security making, whereas in the Czech Republic, it's it's more limited. However, there are some systemic sy systemic and cultural features uh, which I th I think are, are are more important than the, the least. Of documents that are adopted, or, or or names of departments that are that are involved, and I would like to tackle uh, those. And uh, my main point is that uh, that even though the EU and NATO provide some um, um, compatibility in, in 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 terms of some processes and uh, and structures, uh, there is a great problem which is attached to some uh, to some domestic level deficiencies, and this is basically uh, relates to some uh, post-Warsaw Pact heritage. And I would like to stress that uh, we, we are still affected by some negative features by uh, post-Warsaw Pact culture in, in terms of national security making. Uh, but we've also lost some 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 positive uh, features of <laughs> of the of the culture. In interestingly, and and uh, the main negative feature is that um, of the post Warsaw Pact culture is that um, uh, we in 1989 both countries uh, inherited um, national security instruments that were geared for strategy of, of other um, center I mean nam namely Moscow and so uh, I in that moment we were in a more um, in a, in a better position than, for instance, Estonia uh, was. But at the same time, it didn't necessitate uh, us uh, to, to think of what we need those in instruments for. And the 90s weren't um, especially helpful. I mean, the, 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 the attitude of the end of history and also the, uh, the, um, the horizon of the NATO accession for, for both of, of our countries, that became a goal in itself. Uh, in, in a certain moment, and uh, my impression is that, that, that also for a certain um, certain military, so, so suddenly higher military uh, echelons, they actually believe that NATO will provide guidance to the, to the level similar as was the case in, in the Warsaw uh, Pact. 
Um, that could be exemplified in a number of, uh, of situations. I, I'm more aware of those in the, in, in case of Poland, where we, where our ministry uh, uh, embraced um, some of the doctrines which uh, which are were actually fitting our our needs and and which resulted in in, in some ridiculous situation. But I won't go go on to to describe uh, those. The, the situation uh, has begun to change uh, only only recently. And uh, probably to a greater degree in Poland, because we've we've discovered that we face a a threat, and uh, and some of the other uh, so some of the other uh, um, countries. Uh, I mean, uh, some uh, that, that some of our neighbors, some of our partners within the alliance uh, do, do not uh, share our our uh, our view. Um, however. Um, the, the, the main uh, features of this uh, of this pro problem uh, could be uh, could be uh, associ associated with a lack of of a strong political military uh, interface, which is um, we, I mean there, there there's a great deal of research which sh which shows that uh, military uh, is very likely to degrade if they are left for themselves to to give guidance guidance and 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 direction for for themselves and we. We, uh, I think that in the 90s and, and, and um, throughout the beginning period of our NATO uh, membership, we we thought that the, the main feature of, of of a civilian control is to provide is basically to preclude uh, the, the abuse of power by by the military by the military uh, force. Uh, so we we don't have um, an a sufficient number of, of military aware civilians who would who would um, aid politicians uh, and who would um, provide this effective consumer producer uh, portfolio uh, uh, interface between uh, between uh, po politicians and and military. So for in, so there is a uh, so military or for instance intelligence services are actually left for themselves to write their own. Uh, Guidance or or the uh, directions, and uh, there is a, a a weakness as regards, for instance, parliamentary control. I mean, parla parla which is to a great degree uh, of a facade um, nature. And the other compartments co compartments of this uh, problem uh, also um, uh, ca uh, also touch on the education i mean uh, the national security education i mean we, we've had a a boom in terms of national security ed education in poland however it's still quite shallow i mean it's, it either try to, tries to re replicate a professional military education or it's it's a watered down national security Studies with no real um, uh, approach how to um, educate people, how to how to use those in instruments, um, the instruments of, of of power creatively. Also, as regards to think tanks, we see a, a certain progress. However, and you know, the, the, this project is certainly one of the examples that, that you know the the the, the, the the occasion to sit together and to and to discuss and write a, part, uh, a paper certainly helps to 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 fertilize the culture. However, I think that that we need more of a, of, of a more interactive instruments and projects, uh, and um, a little bit of auto promotion. And uh, here, I, I, I mean, because we we work on war gaming projects in, in in our center, I think that this is one of the directions to 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 revive the culture and. Um, this should start on, on a domestic level, uh, first of all. And secondly, uh, going to the to the feature of of a post Warsaw uh, Pact culture, which we lost and which might might have been beneficial to some degree. This is a coordination on, on a domestic level. Um, uh, so I see a great deal of problem as regards as regards that. I mean, this is both a coordination between defense policy and and. and Defense industrial po policy within both governments, and and then um, there is also a problem of, of coordination within ministries of uh, defense, coordination of international security policy and and of uh, defense a acquisition policy, for, for for instance, and that could basically sum sum up my.
Super, Good thank you very much indeed also for keeping so well to time. Um, just one, one small point to point out, thinking we were discussing this last night, that actually the situation is very different in other spheres, particularly relating to border guarding in Poland and the way the Straszkraniczna um, have uh, moved on since the end of the Cold War, but also the way that border, thinking about borders has actually spread across ministerial boundaries, both in Poland and in Czech Republic, if you think of the analytical centre that involves the Foreign Ministry here, the Ministry of Interior and so on, and perhaps that what room there might be for mutual learning uh, from these different processes in slightly different spheres there. Thank you very much indeed. So, enough from me for the time being. I shall hand over to uh, my colleague, Mikhail Szymeczka, um, who I should also add is the current acting coordinator of the Centre for European Security at the Institute. So, Mikhail, please. Yeah, thanks very much, Ben. Um, it is a pleasure and an honour, obviously, to take part in this, in this panel, in which I'm something of an outlier, though, because I haven't been part of the, of, of the project, and I was just um, you know, asked to present a few um, observations of a more general nature, which um, um, are inevitably going to be much less structured than, than my colleagues' presentations. But it's perhaps, you know, I can offer more of an outsider's perspective on Czech-Polish security cooperation and its prospects. So, well, first of all, looking slightly from far and from a certain perspective, I would have to say that, the, that it presents a rather sobering picture. Um, I mean, on one hand, obviously, Warsaw and Prague are, you know, each other's closest allies. But at this particular juncture in the current climate, I, I mean, their security policies seem, at least to me, um, rather sort of out of sync and drifting even further apart. Or I can even say that they seem of, as if they inhabit um, parallel strategic universes, whether in terms of you know, threat perceptions, um, modernization ambitions, defense planning, um, combat readiness, all of these things. I mean, obviously, Polish-Czech security relations were always to some extent structurally asymmetrical because of you know, differences in size of the armed forces or, or geographical location, strategic culture, but recent trends, I mean, notably trends over the past, um, I mean, events of the past uh, few months have made this symmetry or this disconnect, I would say, even more, even more pronounced. I mean, Viet and has already mentioned, obviously, the, and, and it has been mentioned in the previous panels that the, in political terms, obviously, there's divergence, disagreement over over the Russian-Ukraine conflict and its implications. Obviously, for the Czech Republic, Russia's actions um, in Ukraine are, I mean, a matter of concern to the extent that Russia violates international law, undermines the established security order. But for Poland, they, I mean, the same phenomenon constitutes, a, you know, a first-order security threat. It's an entirely different, um, different perception. I mean, in Poland, you have this sort of palpable sense of, of anxiety and, and resolve as well not just among the defense establishment, also in the, among the public at large, and sim you simply don't have that in Prague. Um, where, I mean, and furthermore, obviously, in, in, in Czech public um, position toward um, Russia, the Ukraine conflict uh, remains sort of internally contested um, and often even instrumentalized for domestic political purposes. So that's, you know, one side of the, of, of the sort of disconnect. And obviously in military terms, which is, you know, the second aspect, I mean, Poland is currently embarking on what is, you know, perhaps the most dynamic and ambitious modernization program in recent history of, of NATO countries. Whereas in the Czech Republic, um, what we see is um, policy inertia, or I mean, if you want to put a positive spin on it, you can say policy continuity when it comes to defense. Um, as, and I think we mentioned that as well, that, I mean, I haven't seen any or at least any public discussion of you know, how to revise the country's national security documents in light of the conflict, nor have I detected any efforts to sort of, by the, by the defense ministry or the, or the armed forces to adjust to sort of long-term defense planning, procurement programs perhaps to you know, prioritize assets, capabilities that would be relevant to the newly emerging sort of scenarios of um, you know, hybrid warfare or the increased likelihood of, of conflict in Europe. I mean, these all are all things that the new Polish um, national security strategy already takes into account. Um, and if these sorts of debates take place in the Czech Republic, they certainly haven't reached the public domain, which itself is a problem. I mean, obviously you can point out to the, to the agreement of the Czech coalition parties to um, bring defense spending to 1.5% of GDP by 2020, um, but that hardly constitutes sort of a proper strategic response to the changing security environment. It's, it's, I mean, that numerical commitment is not enough. I mean, or I would say, um, perhaps 
one. I could disagree. Um, yeah, I have four minutes left. So, so where does that, you know, leave bilateral cooperation? I would say that given the degree of this sort of misfit, political as well as military, I think, I mean, uh, some degree of realism would, would be in order. And, and perhaps, uh, you know, my colleagues involved in the research project would arrive at the same conclusions. But that, you know, expectation management is, is key here, that rather than, you know, pushing for some overly ambitious um, projects in bilateral cooperation in military and security terms, I think the challenge would be to preserve and sustain current levels of cooperation, at least in the, at least in the short term. Um, so that, I mean, in, in practice, that means, I mean, unless and until the Czech political elites manage to, to arrive at some sort of a forward-looking strategic vision for their armed forces, perhaps next year, I think both sides would do well to exercise some patience, refrain from too much to ambitious projects and sort of focus on collecting as much of the low hanging fruit as possible. But I mean, let me finish on a positive note that this, this sort of roadmap or prospect, which is modest, but is nevertheless terribly important. And precisely now more than ever, it is important to continue this defense cooperation pre precisely because of the geopolitical uh, or political differences at the very top, uh, it becomes all the more important, all the more, you know, vital to, to continue cooperation um, and, um, you know, at, at, at this level. So I have more to say, but it's good that Ben... Uh, you have a little time. I have, yeah. No, I'll leave it then for the, for the two minutes. Perhaps you will honor us with some more comments once you've uh, um, had the chance to see the questions that we're going to get or hear the questions. Okay, so let's pass on now to uh, Maxim uh, Telekovsky um, from the Polish Institute. Thank you, Ben. I'll be speaking briefly about, uh, about um, uh, the final and the very down-to-earth element of the possible Polish-Czech defense uh, security and defense cooperation, namely the defense industrial cooperation. Uh, we have been working together with Andrzej Dietrich on, on this, uh, on this uh, issue, uh, and since he's, uh, he's uh, uh, sick as well, he, he, he was uh, limited only to, to one panel, which he chaired um, before, and I'm here to say uh, about, uh, about our research so far, our, let's say, first or entry stage of, of, of research. Um, to start with, um, maybe some of you are aware, aware of that, but uh, for the, uh, for the um, uh, sake of the, of the audience, which may, may not be that, that familiar with defense industry, I would like to start with characterizing um, shortly Polish and Czech defense industry. Well, to start with, I should say that both countries have companies which produce weapons, uh, which produce both components of weapons and, um, and some final products. Um, uh, and um, of course, both countries inherited the defense industrial base, so to, so, so it is called uh, after the, uh, the, 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 so the Soviet time. Uh, and the base at that time was uh, largely um, uh, largely exaggerated because of the political realities, because of the fact that the Warsaw Pact was preparing for a large conventional war in Europe, and the military and the industry was meant to support. Uh, the military with uh, with uh, all kinds of weapons. So the main challenge after the end of the Cold War was how to rationalize the defense industry, and um, both countries chose different ways of rationalizing, and this is where the differences between our two countries begin. Uh, in Czech Republic, uh, the base was of course scaled down, but it was also uh, mostly privatized, so that the majority of the uh, of the companies uh, remain in the private hands, with the uh, exception of the uh, of the of the three uh, biggest uh, three biggest uh, companies, the the Lompracha, Explosion, and Vop Czech uh, Republic. So with the with the three three com uh, three uh, these three companies, uh, these, these three companies. Sorry, um, uh, other companies, other firms, be it Ario Vodhody or Czech Zbrojov or Tatra, have uh, significant uh, are in the control of private companies of different origin, including as um, as um, uh, um, let's say exotic as Brazilian uh, Brazilian partners. Uh, in case of Poland, it is different. Uh, Poland has never privatized its uh, military industry without the exception of 
uh, is defense industry with the exception of the aeronautic sector. So the companies which were producing helicopters and um, and um, and planes, mostly in Sweden and Mielec, which were and also in Warsaw, which has been taken over partially in effect of the offset agreements with uh, Sikorsky and um, uh, EADS, which were taken over by the parent companies. Uh, apart from these uh, private uh, companies, uh, all other Polish uh, companies remain under the standard uh, the, the, under the control of the state, mm, and they functioned. They the, the, up until this year, they functioned. Uh, around three different poles. The first pole, so to say, was the state-run holding Bumar, or later renamed to Polish Defense Holding, which uh, organized almost 30 different companies, except uh, from land systems, armor, munitions, uh, military electronics, radar uh, portfolio. Uh, and um, the other two poles, so to say, and were to separate um, uh, separate uh, companies, the uh, Hutas uh, Stalowa Wola, which was uh, producing uh, various land platforms and modernizing also Polish tanks, and by land platforms I mean also howitzers, uh, and the Wuzetem Szymianowice, which was another company responsible and, and manufacturing under the Finnish license, license of Finnish Patria, the Rosomak um, armored vehicle carrier. Uh, so these were the three different, um, um, as I said, poles of cooperation. While um, while uh, the decision was made last year, and now it is implemented to to, to coalesce all the three, all companies into one state-run group, the so-called Polish Defense um, Group um, or PGZ or Pegas, as it is now called in Poland. So basically, in next year, I'm afraid I will take a bit more. Um, uh, <laughs> Not much more. We have a little time to spare, thanks uh, to Mikhail. Okay, that would use it, sorry. Um, uh, just to... Uh, now, now what I was saying, okay. Uh, in Poland, n in next year, we may have at least formal consolidation of all, defense in the, of all defense companies into one group. So, the first difference which is visible is that in Czech Republic we have um, a scattered defense sector with um, smaller companies uh, run by private uh, owners and responsible for the shell before the shareholders whereas in Poland we will have a state controlled single company um, a gigantic company which will be responsible only in front of the um, of the of the state so this is a very first structural difference now coming to what the to the size of the industry uh, it is um, it is assumed that uh, when Polish um, uh, Polish uh, uh, defense uh, defense group will be created, it will employ over twenty thousand employees directly and indirectly even more. While in Czech Republic, the direct employment is below ten thousand, so the difference is like around twice the scale. Again, um, uh, uh, what differs us uh, these two countries. Um, the next factor, the products portfolio, is what is being produced. In Czech Republic, um, the production is concentrated mostly on components and subsystems, with the exception of what I mean by components, of course, parts of uh, of um, weapon platforms uh, like military electronics, um, like uh, elements of aerial structures, like like munitions. Uh, whereas uh, there are no, except of uh, the Albatross uh, plane and some some uh, tat of uh, some um, uh, land platforms offered by Tatra, there is no uh, there is no um, um, there is neither ambition nor plans to 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 be the so-called um, uh, in the the prime contractor or the systems integrator, so a, so a company offering the ready product. In Poland, on the contrary, there is um, there are various uh, end products, and the companies not only uh, used to be prime contractors for different uh, from different for different products, but the, the ambition is to, to to be prime contractors for even more uh, upcoming um, upcoming um, uh, weapon systems which will be developed. And uh, this brings me to the final difference, which I would like to point out: the scale of the market. In Czech Republic, um, the market is worth um, is, is is going down because of the cuts in the uh, defense budget and, uh, and uh, the, the procurement uh, budget, so the money spent actual um, um, actual purchase of, of weapons is low. Um, the general budget is, uh, is, is uh, around 1% of GDP, which uh, equal to 42 billion uh, Czech coronas. Um, uh, so uh, understand around around um, uh, three billions what if I if I if I uh, count it uh, well but uh, whereas in Poland uh, the defense budget is around two percent of GDP and it is meant to be sustained like that and even grow with regards to the special budget um, uh, special budget um, reserved for the for the air missile defense uh, program 
up until 2022, Poland uh, pl plans to spend 130 billion złoty, which is around uh, 30 billion euro uh, on new defense platforms. What means that uh, this is the biggest and the rap most rapidly growing market for weapons in Europe. Uh, attracting foreign contractors, of course, and and of course Polish defense industry. So these are the two. The, these are the differences which I which um, uh, which I would like to point out to. And now, what can we do about it? Well, not much to say the least. The Polish market, which is uh, that huge, is of course attractive for Czech companies, and Czech companies will try to seek their chances in different, particularly smaller, uh, smaller procurement uh, uh, processes, smaller tenders, and that's very good. And they will try to cooperate with Polish companies. We had these examples, for example, a private Czech uh, company specializing in simulators has been offering uh, simulators for the upgrade that a MiG-29 air, uh, uh, aircraft for Poland and, and it was a successful bid. They, they are doing it. There is a cooperation also between, uh, between po uh, Polish and Czech producers of, of uh, fire, firearms, basically, so, so personal, personal weapons. And this is a bottom-up driven cooperation where simply companies which see defense, economy, defense logic cooperate and, and uh, put an offer which can be uh, competitive. But if the industry is to cooperate closer, if we want to create a regional defense industrial base which would, be, uh, in, which would cooperate together, then the policy uh, impetus uh, and policy impulse is needed. There needs to be a top-down impulse, there needs to be conditions created for the companies to actually start working on a common, on a common project. Um, uh, in the framework of either putting um, some money together, intergovernmental money for uh, for research and development of a certain type of technology, um, uh, and creating a kind of an intergovernmental agency uh, which could be or a body which could be responsible for a certain project, a body which could be tasked with running this project and develop, developing at least project um, demonstrator, technology demonstrator, um, then, uh, then, then this would be the, 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 the only way which would create an artificial environment in a very narrow niche for the companies of Czech Republic and Poland to actually come up with some, with some joint proposal, which could then help to develop links between the industry and, and uh, most probably spur further cooperation. Without that, there are too many differences. And just to conclude, there is also a different logic behind thinking about the market. In Czech Republic, the market, the logic behind the policy towards the market is economic logic. So the defense industry needs to support itself, needs to find um, uh, niches and the markets and be competitive. Whereas in Poland, the logic is a bit different. It is a logic of a state which needs autonomous defense industry. It needs, it needs control of the, over the defense industry because of its uh, reading of the threat coming from the from the east so with these two different logics in place uh, the cooperation can exist as i uh, as i uh, as i've just uh, just tried to point out only with with a strong political will underwritten by uh, a sustainable a sustainable project. There can be an idea about one project that would be enough to start, but something that would be waterproof and not end up like the infamous case of mobile air defense radars, which has just been the, the recent fact of a, of a failure. If this kind of project is, uh, is being brought again back at the political level, then we should think of again putting some joint pool of money to develop it and establish a bilateral body responsible for running this project. And we shouldn't be maybe even that ambitious as we were with uh, mobile air defense radars, but start with something smaller just to just as a test bed for this kind of cooperation and uh, gradually build the uh, conditions for this uh, defense uh, industrial cooperation. Sorry for taking a bit more, but Quite okay. There's a lot of I promise I'll do it. Uh...
Thank you, Ben. Uh, I will just point out uh, the, the core difference that I, that I see between the Czech Republic and uh, Poland when it comes to the perception of the current regional uh, security environment. So um, from, from Polish perspective, Polish authorities uh, claim that the current war between Russia and Ukraine uh, is not an um, exceptional even that occurs now and will uh, diminish very very quickly but uh, it is perceived as, as a serious negative impact on the, the European uh, security and uh, there is also a, a, a perception or uh, this uh, the authorities in Poland tend to think that Russia may uh, further destabilize uh, this this uh, security architecture in in Europe, and that of course will bring uh, serious consequences to uh, the security of of Poland. And uh, therefore, Poland uh, supports uh, diplomatic, economic, but also military pressure uh, on Russia within the EU and uh, the NATO. And uh, there is there is a huge and of course uh, because of because of that pressure, uh, Warsaw is also ready to invest significant money on uh, its security. And uh, on the other hand, in the Czech Republic, uh, first of all, there there is uh, there are some doubts how to read the situation, and there is no one voice within the authorities uh, how should the Czech Republic uh, perceive it, and. Uh, Furthermore, there, there is, uh, these authorities tend to think that the, the consequences of aggravation of an economic conflict between uh, the EU and Russia uh, poses a bigger threat to the Czech Republic than the aggressive poli uh, pol policy of Russia on, on Ukraine or Europe uh, as all. Well. And uh, therefore, Prague uh, calls only or mainly for dip uh, diplomatic solution when it comes to resolution of the conflict and is not so eager to support economic, uh, economic pressure, uh, not speaking about uh, any military pressure that could, uh, as Prague says, uh, that could escalate the conflict or escalate Russian uh, policy to towards Ukraine and Europe. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Jak Jakub already summed up some points which I wanted to, uh, to stress as well, but uh, uh, I think that we should not end up in uh, a very pessimistic uh, 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 reading of, of, the, of, the, of the situation and, and perspectives. If you look, some, some I think it was two years ago when there were quite intensive uh, consultations between the deputy ministers of defense and, uh, and, and uh, foreign policy uh, between the Czech Republic and and Poland, and I think that there was quite an agenda to uh, to, to 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 discuss, and perhaps that might be a, a point of departure to to uh, go back to this scheme and uh, try to find out uh, what's uh, what's possible and what is not. Actually, the the Czech reading of the situation and of the of the uh, Russian-Ukrainian conflict in the in the population is that the Czech Republic should not step into it uh, and uh, that's the, the the Czechs are actually firm uh, that the Czech Republic should not actively engage into the uh, current situation that's the reading from the opinion pools and uh, uh, they s believe that uh, there is a, a room uh, that's interesting rather for the UN or or for, for perhaps for the EU, but not for uh, the Czech Republic as itself. And that's kind of a reading of the situation. It's not that huge security uh, security threat for uh, for for us. Uh, yes, that's something what Michal said uh, about uh, about the defense spending. Of course, that we have to know what's the purpose of the of the rising of the defense spending. It should not be just the the. Uh, the uh, uh, just the fact that uh, NATO says that defense spending should be at two percent, there should be some kind of uh, explanation of, of for what this money should be used and what is the what are our security 
what is actually our security po policy right now. And perhaps one more comment on the current political elite's uh, attitude uh, towards uh, what's going on and towards mainly to the fact that uh, the, the prime minister uh, opposed uh, enhancement of the of the of the NATO troops or uh, in in the central and eastern Europe. I think that those politicians very well remember the hot debate about the missile defense in the Czech Republic, and that was kind of a point which uh, I believe formed their attitude towards these issues. And as I don't think that there was a huge discussion after. Uh, the, the the plan of the on the, on the MD was uh, uh, was uh, changed uh, about uh, any other possible statement of, of of foreign troops in the Czech Republic and those uh, very selective responses on on the current issue shows that it not it has not been discussed enough uh, even in the political parties. Super. Thank you very much. Or uh, that, that I think um, prospects for better and more um, fruitful defense cooperation uh, between our nations lie, first of all, uh, in uh, fixing some domestic problems, which I was trying trying to outline. And I agree. Uh, I think with, with what Vitek was trying to uh, to, um, uh, to say that that um, actually, you know, the cooperation sh should not be for this. Uh, or, you know, as you mentioned, the defense spending, but the, uh, the, the cooperation should not be uh, perceived uh, as a goal in itself. I mean, it should serve um, um, tackling some threats or, or, or opportunities. And in order to be able to do so, we, have a, we need a stronger political military interface. Um, and um, one of the problems I, I mentioned is, is this deficiency of of uh, deficit of, of uh, military informed civilians uh, and lack of tools like wargaming or also econometrics. Because, for instance, if our governments have some problems with 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 a coordinated defense and defense industrial policies and have some problems if, if with interdepartmental procurement, they will not be able to uh, seize opportunities in in uh, multinational co cooperation. Super, thank you very much indeed. Yes, thanks. I'm going to pick up on your suggestions that we sh suggestion that we should also discuss what's the purpose of cooperation and yeah. Sorry, please. No, no. Yeah. And you know, without delving too deeply into you know metaphysics and what's you know what's the purpose of what, um, uh, let, just let me kind of make a some a conceptual point and which is a bit counterintuitive on what's the purpose of Visegrad cooperation in, in defense or in this case in this case bilateral cooperation um, I mean you we all recall that it sort of it gained kind of momentum and, and, and urgency under the spell of the financial crisis when and obviously the austerity paradigm whereupon it, it was framed as, a, as as an economics problem or as a, as a sort of rational response to shrinking military budgets then we would sort of um, work together. So there was you, you, a lot of time you heard, hear the argument, and, and Tomas has made it now, that, it sh that all of these cooperation projects should be sort of strictly results oriented and should be sort of informed by this functionist logic of, you know, defense economics and uh, technological synergies and, and, you know, closing capability gaps and all that. Um, and leaders were, or policymakers were warned against sort of um, cooperation being di dictated by political agendas, i.e., you know, leaders need to demonstrate Visegrad unity and have something to show for it. It has to be sort of results-oriented. I wonder, and this is the counterintuitive part, whether perhaps in today's sort of changed reality, where our biggest worry, I mean, obviously austerity remains a problem, but, but our biggest worry at the moment is the sort of disunity at the top um, in, in Visegrad and geopolitical disunity, whether perhaps um, the politics of cooperation and you know, the political symbolism that it yields is, is is cannot be framed as one of the one of the important purposes in itself. Um, so I would even dare to say that at the t in today's atmospherics, these cooperation projects—I mean, their value, their political value—as sort of an affirmation of regional solidarity is perhaps greater than their um, fiscal or military value, so to speak. 
and you know all the more since the tangible results haven't been that great. So, so this is perhaps one of the. I mean, I'm not suggesting that we start you know Potemkin projects and subordinate common sense to symbolism and you know just pursue cooperation for the sake of cooperation. But if there ever were a context under which this made strategic sense, it would be now. This would be perhaps um, yeah. I, Climate. Super, thank you very much. I think that's a very interesting point as a counterpoint to some of the more instrumental logics that we've heard for cooperation, so plenty to, to chew on there. Right, um, do be thinking of your questions. I would ask anyone who has a question for Vic Dostal, particularly to come forward first, once we've heard... Uh, Okay, very quickly, I will try to in one minute to make up from what I took earlier. I would say that the structural problem in Polish, Czech, and broadly also speaking, defense uh, in security cooperation in the Visegrad region is that if there is political will, there is no, um, it is not institu institutional, institutionalized so that an agency, a team, a group, or any body designated by decision maker is, is tasked to deliver and will be uh, li liable for not delivering. So this is uh, the one case. The other case is that the, that there may be a, a bottom-up idea but at the time when there is no political will. So a way forward either in defense industrial cooperation, in military cooperation is to have a political will and a um, pledge to deliver for uh, for uh, the lower levels of um, uh, of uh, decision makers in civil and military uh, establishments like it is uh, the case for example in the french uh, british uh, partnership where the uh, political will which is present at that level and expect uh, and there is uh, uh, and Apart from the political will, there is expectancy that the planists, the people from defense industry, will deliver, and they have to deliver because this is what the leaders want from them. Uh, if it is institutionalized like this, then we may expect some breakthroughs and some uh, moving forward if it is cooperation. If there is only political will or only bottom-up ideas, it will not work. Thank you. I think anyone familiar with the history of British procure procurement, more generally, and particularly military procurement, will know that doesn't always run quite as smooth as. Uh, as we would like. All right, okay, so I know we have one question. Are there any other questions um, to the panel um, for the time being? Please raise your hand and I will come to you. We'll ask the questions. You can identify yourself, please, and then also address your question, particularly either to an individual member of the panel or to the panel as a whole. So. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rick Fawn from uh, St. Andrews in the UK. Uh, very informative panel. So, uh, very big thank you to everyone. Uh, yeah, I mean, it seems to me, as a relative outsider, that there's probably a very big divide between the Czech Republic and Poland on a number of issues, and particularly the, the Russian-Ukrainian crisis. Uh, the, the, the two related questions I would have uh, could be to anyone, but I think we particularly addressed some of these points uh, already, so forgive me if it, if it seems <laughs> directed uh, in that way. Uh, and I liked your comment about leaving the, the president aside, although my, my starting point would actually be to say uh, presidents plural, two out of three, um, and they, they need to be brought in because they do both make, I think, quite outstanding statements. I mean, Václav Klaus has comments on his uh, official website saying that the Russians should be happy with the annexation of Crimea, among other things. And I, I think from perhaps an outsider's perspective, Prime Minister Sobotka looks more of an outlier than, than the comments here suggested. The, the Financial Times on Friday picked, perhaps picked on him as the one figure in, in the EU who wants to reduce sanctions. And he certainly made comments about giving Russia a chance and, and, and such. So it does seem that there is a different approach at different levels within the Czech political system on the crisis. And what I'm partly wondering is if, if you could help to explain further why that is. And then really my second question, which is, while Poland might be thinking about traditional hard security for various obvious reasons emanating from the East, uh, if one looks at the, the reports that the intelligence services in the Czech Republic produce, their concerns are of financial infiltration in the Czech Republic. And I'm really wondering if there's a correlation between these two points. I mean, the, the soft line on things East, and at least from the security services point of view, a very different threat. Uh, a seemingly ominous present 
um, societal, financial, uh, perhaps energy one, which is very different from the hard security that we've been talking about. So thank you very much. Super. Thank you very much indeed for that question. In order to give Veet and some of the other panellists who may wish to respond to that um, time to think it over a little bit, can we just see if there are any more questions for now, please? Okay, yes, please. Well, I, I guess I'll have to direct this toward everybody. Uh, Don Baca from DePaul University and Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Um, attitudes and support always have to be driven by whose interests are threatened, whatever the interest may be. Obviously, everybody's interests are different, security, economics, political, or whatever. Uh, Poland's interest and the threats to them are obviously inherently different than anybody, anybody and everybody else's, including the Czech Republic's. So that's always true for each country. It's always going to be true. The only answer, it seems to me, is that the reality is to reach a common consensus as to where, draw, where to draw lines, if lines are going to be drawn, and then be prepared to react. But that's before lines are crossed. And nobody seems to be doing that here. Do you as a panel feel that we have successfully drawn any lines? Because you can't build a consensus, you can't build a plan of action, you can't do anything until you have. Um, you're going to have to build a common consensus on what you want, what your objective is, what you're going to do to meet it. Um, it seems to me that the obvious failure is already that exists is that nobody's done that. I mean, if nations are lucky, these crises are slow moving. You get a chance to go and dig something out and salvage something, which it seems like that's all anybody's scrambling to do right now. But where is the line going to be drawn? Where do, where do you think Poland needs the, law, the line to be drawn? The Czech Republic's line obviously has to be drawn in a different place because there's no, obviously, no tangible physical security threat at the moment or anything like that. Um, I just appreciate your input on that. Thank you. Super. Thank you. That certainly gives a lot of scope to uh, address and uh, perhaps recalibrate some of the discussions we've had so far. Okay. We take one more question for this round. Um, do we have? Yes, please. Uh, Tomasz Hlebeczek, uh, the local co collaborator of the German Marshall Fund. Uh, I have a rather technical question, uh, maybe uh, directed to uh, my Polish uh, namesake or to other Polish uh, panelists uh, regarding uh, the uh, procurement uh, administrative uh, structure uh, uh, in your uh, defense ministry. Do you have uh, something like uh, the US uh, JROC uh, Joint Requirements Oversight uh, Council where Basically, uh, both requirements uh, and budgets are considered from both uh, political and military perspectives, and uh, decisions uh, taken uh, at that board uh, realistic, uh, regardless of the uh, party or administration in power, barring um, major budgetary pressures, or uh, maybe as an uh, as an anecdotal evidence uh, to this. We've been uh, really struggling uh, with this uh, process in this country, as is uh, generally uh, well known for the last 20 years. For example, as you might or uh, may or may not know, uh, last week uh, the commander of the Czech Air Force just uh, floated out an idea with, uh, with local journalists that uh, our fleet uh, of Gripen fighters uh, should be raised, uh, increased by almost uh, 50%. And it just came out of nowhere. It's, been, it's not been mentioned in any uh, strategic documents. Uh, nobody has talked about this. Uh, uh, this requirement has never come out and uh, was not validated by anyone. Obviously, the, the difference uh, uh, to the US couldn't be starker uh, if this happened in the US before the chief of the Air Force uh, could have been baked alive in front of the Congress. He would have been relieved uh, from his job uh, almost immediately. So I, I just have a hypothetical question for you. Uh, can you imagine something like this happening in Poland? Thank you. OK, right. Um, I think what we'll do is take the order, questions in the order in which they were asked. So I'll ask uh, Viet, first of all, to respond to Rick Fawn's question. And then if anyone else would like to, to jump in with their part of response to that. Um, then, if the panel could let me know who would like to respond to the question from the end of the room here. Um, and then finally, perhaps, Tomasz, you can respond to the question from uh, Tomasz Kubicek. Okay. So, Vic, please take us away. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, of course, the, the, the reason why I put aside uh, the president or presidents was uh, 
was for the for the sake of making my presentation somehow somehow uh, doable. Uh, anyway, uh, of course, there are many voices on what's going on, and it's not only between uh, the government and, uh, and the president, but also within the government. You can see the position of the of this uh, uh, ministry and the position of the prime minister and the position of the ministry of trade and industry, and they uh, diverge on various issues. And of course, the the, the, the way how on the sanctions is uh, is uh, how the sanctions are depicted in uh, in the media is one of the, the 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 major differences yet if you look on what happened i think yesterday or the day before yesterday in brussels when uh, uh when the sanctions next round of sanctions was uh, uh was uh, uh agreed on on the foreign affairs council and the, the fact that uh, the our Minister also supported uh, the next uh, next row of sanctions. Then you can see that uh, the, uh, the the way how the foreign policy is conducted is not exactly the way how it is presented here uh, in in the Czech Republic. On the other hand, of course, that this might be a problem, and it's very much uh, uh, in touch with your second question because uh, uh, there are some parts of industry which uh, uh, see. Uh, the Russian market as a great opportunity, and perhaps that's also a legacy of, of Václav Klaus, because he was the one who made a huge visits to, to Russia and who had the open door and who uh, uh, offered the businessmen uh, to, 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 to get them on the, on the, on the board of, the, of his plane and to, to, to organize a huge forum for, for them in, in Russia. And uh, uh, Russia was in last year's uh, uh, shown as a, as, a, as a new emerging market with uh, huge opportunities for uh, for for the Czech uh, uh, business, mainly for the Czech uh, uh, Czech uh, machinery industry, and that's the that's I don't have any 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 uh, uh, proof of that. But if you look, there's one example, and there was the Crimea. Uh, First, the, the, our foreign minister was among the first who sa said that there should be some kind of sanctions against Russia if that happened. And then the prime minister made a trip to northern Moravia and met uh, some local businessmen in Ostrava. And then he had a, a speech when he said that, to, yeah, but sanctions should not harm our industry. And there was the press statement of the of the Chamber of Commerce, which said how, ma how many thousands of uh, of employees may. may uh, may lose their job, and and uh, uh, the prime minister followed that uh, that that position, and it was also it was before uh, elections and so on. But uh, there is a lack of strategic thinking when it comes to these issues, except for this uh, lovely lovely building. Uh, but and that's that's actually the, the the problem, and of course that it opens the door for uh, any. Uh, uh, Interests, uh, uh, as it was uh, mentioned in the in the report of the of the of the intelligence service, and uh, okay, then, can I ask you just to wrap it sorry, up? sorry, okay. sorry, but uh, it's a very huge uh, question. But uh, yeah, uh, and of course the Russian propaganda can use it very instrumentally because uh, the Czech Republic was not in that camp before before in with the last uh, last government. It was in the in the different camp and. It, it's it's good way how to uh, how to depict that the, the the European position is not that uh, uh, that that, that, that uh, coherent. So sorry. Super. Okay. <laughs> I have to run. Sorry. Not at all. Now, Vic unfortunately has to take off. But thank you very much for providing such a comprehensive answer. First, okay. Is there anyone else on the panel who would like to comment on the first question briefly? Okay, I'm sure we can continue the discussion in other formats later on. All right, uh, so turning to the, um, the second question that was asked, um, I'll first ask if the panel have, uh, who from the panel has responses, and then perhaps I also have a little something to, uh, to throw into the mix on that one. Mikhail and Tomáš. Okay, so we'll take first of all Mikhail and then Tomáš, and uh, then I'll throw my two cents in as well. So, Mikhail, please. Uh, yeah, that was the question on how and whether we can sort of draw a line and then create a consensus um, among the regional government where the line is and what the, um, where the tripwire is and then what should, what should follow once it is crossed. Now, 
it seems to me that there, are, I mean, that there are multiple problems with this, and one is that, I mean, there already was a line. I mean, once, once the um, Russian, I mean, we're speaking about Russian actions, I presume, and once there was clear evidence of Russian um, troops in eastern Ukraine. I mean, the EU has reacted with sanctions to which all the countries subscribed, including the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary. Um, so one can argue that there already was a line and was crossed, and an action followed. But it's obviously much more complex than that, especially with drawing lines, because that's part of what, what, what Russia's policy is about, that it's those, you know, the hybrid warfare, the, the shadowy way of, of, you know, of acting with ambivalence and always you know, deniability, which makes it very difficult for, for you know, governments and the EU and NATO to set line, because uh, you, never, you always can, can argue that it hasn't really been, uh, hasn't really been crossed, and those who would, uh, who would be in favor in the West or in, in, in Central Europe, those who have been in favor of a more cautious approach can always jump on that argument that, I mean, listen, the run hasn't really been crossed because there aren't real Russian, for instance, troops in, you know, in whatever territory we're discussing. And obviously the other problem with, the, with drawing the line is that it's a problem of credibility as, as the U.S. President discovered in Syria and, and elsewhere. So that's also a danger of, say, let's, uh, let's draw a line somewhere and then act that, that it's also a risk to, to some extent. Now, but finally, I think where, where, where these Central European countries and Central European countries can find common ground is not, is not really uh, in their um, threat perception of Russia. I don't think there's any chance of actual alignment of them ever seeing eye to eye on this. But, it's, but I think it's Ukraine. Um, and I think it, all countries share an interest in seeing Ukraine, you know, pull itself out of the brink economically, politically. All have, I mean, all, for all of these countries, Ukraine's potential, you know, social or you know, this political, economic disintegration is a grave risk, irrespective of what they think of Russia's, you know, menacing neoliberal designs. So I think where, where you want to find common ground, I, I think it would be Ukraine and the other Eastern partners rather than um, Russia itself. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you, Mikhail. Okay, Tomasz, um, brief response to this. Thank you. On a Polish perspective, to lines, uh, at least my, my reading uh, of uh, of that. I mean, so Poland is determined. Certainly, it's determined to um, to respond to a, to, to, a, to crossing the line that is already drawn. I mean, the the um, breach of the of the um, of um, interest, breach of uh, territories, sovereignty of of a NATO ally, and I think that this is this regard both. This pertains to classic scenario and also hybrid scenario, and Poland would would be likely to. Um, assist a country which is an, uh, um, a, a victim of an unconventional attack um, in order to call the bluff and, and, and in order to prevent uh, the escalation, escalation under the classic definition of, a, of an aggression. Uh, it, it is more difficult to draw lines as regards situation outside of, of NATO and, uh, and I think that as long as crisis in, in, in Ukraine is a simmering um, pot, then, then I, I don't think that Poland will escalate its its involvement. But uh, I think that a further step might be a situation where we could see a full-scale overt invasion uh, aimed at toppling and uh, at basically regime change in Kiev. I don't think that Poland would uh, would be likely to be involved, but I think that Poland might be more uh, c uh, creative in in uh, joining some 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 uh, multinational uh, action. I know equipment uh, supply or, or, or some, some other forts, uh, forms of, of more uh, active uh, involvement. Okay, I'm being begged by, the, by Mecca for one, one last sentence. comment on that, so I will go back to him very quickly. I'm terribly sorry, just one sentence about this drawing line is that once you, once you draw it, that's where uh, Russia is going to try to undermine our, yeah. our credibility. If, if you draw it there, that's where the next attempt to test it is going to be. Which is just to in, just interject, I, just, I find it ironic that Poland and the Czech Republic, Czechoslovakia has passed, of course. If anybody should be more sensitive to lines being crossed in Europe and then having nothing done about them, perhaps Poland and Czechoslovakia should be more than anyone. Okay, thank you very much. I will briefly add something as a, um, so a, a wider thing to consider. Two, two points. First of all, um, the EU has rarely been in the business of drawing lines, and we do operate in an EU context. The EU has classically operated on a basis of what Francois Heisberg called constructive ambiguity. 
working through problems, disagreements, and so on, through the politics of confusion, essentially, about creating minimal grounds for cooperation, which may speak a little bit, perhaps, to Mikhail's uh, notion before that the process itself is actually the goal. Secondly, as Tim Ingold, uh, the anthropologist, pointed out, not all lines are created equal. What we're talking about when drawing lines here is basically an issue of securitization, how something is made into a security issue and then how it's acted upon. Whether that's done discursively through the declarations of politicians, through appeals to values or so on, as you're just mentioning then, or whether it's done through the practices of uh, socialized actors within security agencies, within the military, within police, within border guard or so on. These all have an effect on then um, whether these, these lines, if we, that's what we're still going to call them, are actually drawn or not. But it's then what is done with them, and that's what we're seeing a real confusion in both scholarship and practice of at the moment, is this idea of once something had becomes a security issue, once a line is seemingly drawn, what do you do about it? The Syria example is a very good one there. There have been numerous others over the years. So we're asking a lot of complex questions which actually pertain directly to the subject of this panel uh, in that regard. Exactly drawing lines, do you put the cart before the horse, or actually do you put it the other way around? Which way do you want to actually do this, and how do you go about doing that? Well, that to some extent requires procedures in place, to other extent it requires politics to actually happen and politics to be openly discussed. So uh, perhaps more contextualization there. Okay, I will now ask uh, Tomasz Szatkowski uh, to respond to the third question and then perhaps we can have uh, a last round of quick questions from the audience or come back to response from the panel if people would like that. So, thank you, Tomasz. Uh, Tomasz, I think uh, uh, there, there was a very good, very good question and I'm afraid that problems that Polish problems are similar to Czech ones on that uh, I think that what you're referring to is in a way similar to um, the, to the need for for an approach that was taken by McNamara's um, sec, um, team uh, when when he was leading the US um, uh, def, uh, the Department of Defense and when he established a, a holistic um, approach to, to, to defense capability acquisitions and he uh, very much introduced uh, e economical logic into that. Uh, so I would like to uh, point out to a couple of uh, f facets of the problem. First of all, the life cycle um, approach and I think that, that, that there are still problems on that issue both in Czech Republic and in Poland and we also saw instances of, of that as regards our procurement of F-16 fleet, which didn't cover at, at first some issues like training or, or, or some other logistical uh, issues related to that capability. Uh, we, I mean, recently we purchased another batch of Leopard 2 uh, tanks, but the logistical agreement didn't um, didn't come with the, with the, with the procurement uh, agreement, so this is certainly Again, displays that that there there is a, a, a problem with this holistic approach to, uh, uh, to to the to the life cycle of the of the capability. And secondly, wider problem, uh, defense economical approach. Uh, so, a, the, there is a lack of a top-down approach at ministries of defense. So the the, the procurement pro, pro, programs are rather. Um, collection of bottom up of bottom up uh, ideas and and, and wishes and um, they are not um, looked upon i mean uh, there is no body which could which could assist the minister of defense in order to uh, draw some options uh, um, some alternative options and actually look at their econ economic benefits or or, or or downsides so so uh, it is 